All right, we'll uh, go ahead and get started here. Hey, everyone. My name is Chris McCurdy. I'm a solutions architect with Amazon Web Services, uh, specialized in healthcare and life sciences. I'm excited to be here today. I see a lot of faces of folks who I've worked with in the past and a bunch of new faces who I'm excited to meet. Um, and I'm excited today to talk about building IoT applications with AWS uh, Amazon Echo, as well as to bring Nitin Grujwal up here, who is the Director of Software Engineering and Innovation at Boston Children. And what we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk about three different stories. So the first story is kind of based on a recent experience of mine where uh, I was part of a project to go and build out a IoT device. This was a, a pill dispensing device that was used in a laboratory setting to go and distribute pills so that technicians could go and give them out to whatever setting they needed to give it to. And so uh, there, there was a lot of business requirements around that, like making sure that the uh, pills were delivered on time, that they were uh, done on a regular basis, all that sort of stuff. So it really it was about building a device, making it smart, and getting the analytics so that they can improve outcomes in the future. The second story, uh, this was from further back, which was I, I worked with a customer who they really wanted to get into the uh, wearable um, mobile device space, but they didn't really want to integrate with all the different vendors that are out there and all the different frameworks and platforms, and they wanted to be able to go through and just use uh, a, a, a platform that did most of that heavy lifting for them so that they could just focus on improving outcomes or whatever business value that they wanted to improve. And then lastly, uh, and I think this is the most compelling of the stories, um, how many folks have been up at uh, 3 in the morning and they've had their child who's got a fever, 103 degrees or something of that nature, and they know what they should do, they know to administer water or to uh, uh, give some sort of like Advil or acetaminophen, but they're looking for that extra bit of reassurance. And so they go onto the internet, they go and they Google them just to make sure that they're doing the right thing, just so they have that, that, extra, that extra help. Well, Nitin is gonna come up here and talk about a, a Alexa skill that they built at Boston Children's called Kim's Kids MD, which helps with just that situation. It, it allows parents to go and interact with this device and know that they're doing the right thing in those moments when they're looking for that just that little extra bit of help. So first, I want to get a primer so that we can kind of all be on the same place when talking about IoT. And this is in my own words. This isn't uh, like a Wikipedia definition or anything. And so what is IoT? I, I look at it as taking the world of otherwise disconnected or semi-connected devices and adding smarts to them such that they can take whatever information or metrics or telemetry that they generate send that off to a cloud or a processing agent who can then drive new insights, new analytics, et cetera, and send that back to that device so that device can now act in a much more intelligent and um, more meaningful way. So what is AWS IoT then? So what's the difference? Well, AWS IoT provides the, scaleless, or, so the scalable, seamless framework such that if you design using the best practices, you can go from a single device up to several tens, hundreds, millions of devices, all using the same architecture and the same framework. So you don't run into the, the problems that you see in other spaces where you need to consider, okay, what happens when I hit 10,000? What happens when I hit 100,000? I'm gonna have to re-architecture when we hit 500,000. If you use this architecture with AWS IoT and the other associated services that we'll talk about, you can scale right through that and just focus on the business problems that you're trying to solve. Another key thing that AWS IoT does is not all devices live forever, so you, when it comes time for your environment to scale back down or roll out a new version, you need to scale appropriately. AWS IoT, like all of AWS services, you can scale back down. You can match your infrastructure to your cost so you don't have a bunch of iron that's sitting around uh, not being used because you've now rolled on to the next version. Now before we go too far, I wanna talk about security first. I think this is a, a key concept that's applied across all software, uh, IoT, most specifically because it's, it's a, a fairly new space. But the first thing is that AWS IoT, is, uh, sorry, AWS as part of the shared responsibility model um, offers many ways so that you can integrate certificates. So all interaction with AWS IoT needs to be secured over TLS. And we'll talk about protocols in a little bit. But to secure that, you need to make sure that you're using proper certificates. So we offer three ways for doing that. The first way is AWS managed certificates. So you can just go into the AWS console or through the CLR or, th or CLI or through uh, the 
one of the SDKs, and just generate a certificate. AWS will gen up the private keys, the public keys, the certs, send it over to you, immediately destroy that private key so it's never kept beyond some sort of ephemeral state. Uh, some folks uh, aren't comfortable with AWS having generated that private key, totally understandable. So we offered a certificate sign request. This is the ability that you can go generate your own certificate, generate a sign, signing request from that, which basically says that this is a true and valid certificate and send that to AWS. And then we will then respect your certificate, your private key never having touched AWS's services. And then lastly, we recently introduced just-in-time certificates, which the concept there is that you sign a uh, root certificate, you sign that, register that with AWS, and then any devices that are signed with that root certificate can then get registered um, by themselves, so you don't have to go through and manage it or set up some sort of process to manage it. But the key of this slide is really the bottom part, which is make sure you protect your certificates, you protect everything within your device. So make sure that you're setting up the right permissions, you're using the right CH root, the right permissions there. You're, if possible, you're using security-enhanced Linux or security-enhanced um, operating systems that are available for your device. Um, you might be able to use one-time programmable fuses, or if your device in and of itself isn't trustworthy or maybe tampered with, look into things like trusted platform modules, smart boxes, look into uh, locks and boxes, that sort of stuff. But the key is to make sure that you have a plan, you have something in place, so even before you get started, before you even start building whatever solution you have, you know what your security plan is, what your posture is, and how you're going to go with it going forward, and it's regularly checked on to make sure that you're building a secure and sound solution. So as part of this story, I'm going to take it through the, the different um, uh, parts of a, uh, AWS IoT and kind of break down uh, little code snippets that kind of show how we build the solution in the end. So we're going to start with the thing gateway, or sometimes called the device gateway. This uh, service, or this part of AWS IoT, allows you to have several devices all through a pub-sub mechanism, route through the gateway, and then communicate with AWS so that you could have many services listening to many devices and transmitting back and forth in a nice seamless manner so uh, you don't have to do much heavy lifting. Now as part of this thing gateway, there's three supported protocols. The first two are fairly familiar to folks, uh, HTTPS and WebSockets. The third might be a little less familiar, that's secure MQTT. So MQTT, for a bit of a, a history sidestep, so this originated in the 90s in the oil fields for communication between oil platforms and satellites. And the main takeaway with this was basically a low voltage bang for your buck protocol that was able to communicate whatever it needed to communicate in a pub sub manner uh, to that satellite in a, in a very efficient means. So that aligns up really nicely with the IoT space. So of course we're not talking about oil rigs talking with satellites, we're talking about uh, devices with small little batteries talking to whatever their hub is. It's just the same idea on a smaller scale. So, we took MQTT, and the original MQTT did not have uh, a secure layer on top of it, so we layered TLS on it. So sometimes you'll hear it as MQTT with TLS or uh, MQTTS, but it's really just this pub-sub protocol that originated back in the 90s. Now here's a quick code example. I just wanted to show how you could interact with this, and this is using uh, a, Grove, uh, SD, a Grove SDK or Grove IoT kit, which uh, you can Google that. There's a whole bunch of IoT kits out of there, but this is just a quick example to show you how easy it is to publish an MQTT message. So what I've highlighted in bold there is just device.publish, whatever topic, and whatever value you want to send. So there's, I mean, barring the new lines I have here, there's only about seven lines of code to send this data over MQTT in a secure manner so that it can be received in AWS. So pretty, pretty simple. So moving on from that, we have the IoT rules engine. So um, getting the data into AWS, into this gateway, is fine and all, but where do you want to send it from there? There's a whole lot of services and a whole lot of things you can do with it. So the rules engine provides you a mechanism for sending that data wherever you need to send it to. So your data flows in, flows into the gateway. Your rules engine there, through a nice SQL-like syntax, you can say, select star messages and send them to Kinesis. Send them to S3 bucket. Send them both places. There's a whole lot of use cases here, and I'm sorry about the relatively small font, but some big ones to really call out. So you can filter messages. You can send some messages this direction, other messages this way, based on message characteristics or based on sender, that sort of stuff. Uh, you can send your files to S3, so maybe you just want to take all your data in, send it straight to S3, load it there, you can do that. 
Uh, maybe you want, as soon as this particular message comes in from a particular device, you want to send it off to SNS so you, a mobile push message can go out or an email can go out. You can do that. Or, as we're going to talk about in a little bit, maybe you have a whole lot of messages that are coming out and you want to send them to Kinesis. So you can do your analytics, your real-time analytics, or you want to bundle them up and process them with Lambda or something like that. You can do that just the same. So you can see there's a whole lot of use cases here and there's more growing by the day. Now, I mentioned earlier the SQL-like syntax. You can see here, um, I'm by no means a SQL expert, but this is pretty easy to use. So uh, select star from sensor dispensing sensor. So this was that device that I mentioned earlier, which is dispense medication. So in this case here, I took all those messages and sent them on over to Kinesis. So just select star, send it to Kinesis, specify a role, what stream you want to send it to, and then a partition key, which that's just your partition of your Kinesis stream. In this case here, um, based on the number of clients, it made more than sufficient of a, a partition key for me. But you can see here it's pretty easy to use. Next piece, the thing registry. So one of the things we saw when people started using uh, IoT, or very first thing they did, was build up some way to store metadata, metadata about these devices. So they want to be able to store, uh, like some examples here, like what the MQTT ID is for that device, what certificates are associated with that. Uh, so we have the thing registry, which allows you to do all that right out of the box, and then also specify up to three custom attributes. So maybe you want to store what the serial number is, or something like that of that particular device. You can do that through the thing registry. Now here's an example of what the JSON around the thing registry looks like. So you can see here, it's pretty easy to understand. In this case here, this dispensing unit uh, had a dispensing volume of 75, and it was a model number 123. So uh, pretty readable, pretty easy, and these attributes carried along with that thing. So um, whenever I wanted to query it, just do a quick query call and off you go. And then updating it is just the same. So maybe this device actually got upgraded to a 150 unit device. You can just do, this is using Bodo now, so you can do a client update thing set the dispensing volume to 150, you're off and going. There's other cool features here as well that's uh, less called out. And you see on the bottom there that expected version. So you have the ability to set what the expected version is, so that way if you have multiple setters that are calling, it knows which one to go and process, and that way they don't end up overriding each other because of some asynchronicity that happens. Now the last piece of the AWS IoT kind of subservices, I guess you'd say, or services that are part of the platform, is the thing shadow. And really this first bullet point sums it up, and I think it's pretty powerful. And this is, is the ability to store the current and future state of the device, um, whether or not it's connected to the internet or not. So uh, way back when, when I was interacting with devices, I always had to maintain what was that state between, um, uh, so if I had a device out in the field and I had my cloud compute, I had to make sure, is that device connected? What, what's the state of it? maintain all that connection, if the device went offline, being able to synchronize all that, and it became this huge amount of, of cruft work that happened in the middle to make sure that I was communicating properly with the device. So the thing shadow allows you to be abstracted away from that. You can now write to this shadow. So if the device is not there, you write to the shadow. When the device comes online, it can read from the shadow, sync right up, it's up and going. Likewise, if the thing is out in the field, maybe it's, it's not connected or whatever, it can make whatever updates it needs to update. As soon as it syncs back up with the internet, that syncs back across, everything is really good. You don't have to worry about all those nights, me tearing out my hair, you don't have to worry about when you use the thing shadow. Now here's a quick example of that. So in this case here, the device was set to uh, off, so the re reported sen sensor state was off, but the desired state was on, so we wanted to turn that device back on. So you can see here, desired state on, reported state off, delta on, so next time that device connects up, it'll sync up, it goes to on, off and running. To set it, using Bodo again, really easy again. You just set whatever your delta is, so the delta state, update thing shadow, pass that data in, poof, you now updated that. Now that kind of covers AWS IoT, but what have we really done? So we've inbounded this data, we got it to the gateway, we got it to the rules engine, and we can send it off to a whole lot of places, but uh, we, we really haven't built an end-to-end -end solution. We've just sort of got it in the door. So, to go beyond that, I think you really need to talk about three other services that play along with it. So the first is Kinesis. Uh, Kinesis is our, our data streaming service. The really cool thing with Kinesis is, again, you can handle small workloads or large workloads. You just split and merge your streams appropriately as your, as your data or your, your traffic increases or decreases. Um, it also has the ability to do real-time analytics. You can also replay your data. It's all sorts of cool features, and uh, it matches this architecture uh, fantastically. The next piece. DynamoDB. So DynamoDB is our unstructured 
uh, database that we have. So with this, there's really two knobs you can turn on DynamoDB. The first is the write capacity units. This is how fast it can write to the database. The other knob is the read capacity units, how much you can read or how fast you can read from the database. Uh, with that, you can really easily, as again, as your workload, as your number of devices in the field goes from 1, 10, 100, whatever, you can just turn that knob up, or as it goes down, you can turn that knob back down and can totally control your cost and your infrastructure, and you're not building all sorts of architecture to go and maintain that jump from 100,000 devices to 500,000 devices. Now, from a, an architectural standpoint, if we just wanted to keep it pretty easy, uh, that would be enough. That would get your data all the way into to Dynamo. Once it's in Dynamo, then you could get it out however you wanted to get it out. But I've found in doing this a handful of times here that Lambda is becoming a real key part of, part of this architecture. So when, what I've seen is, uh, so when you st stream your data in, you get it through the rules engine, you get it to Kinesis, you're about to load it into Dynamo, you'll find that there's little things you need to do. There's data you need to tweak, there's filters you need to apply, uh, there's all these little things that always crop up. And so you need something to, to be that glue that's in the system. And Lambda does that for you, so you can write whatever little filter you need. Uh, it ties in directly with your Kinesis stream, so it can listen to the stream, write to DynamoDB, um, and it's all really, really easy to do. Um, with Lambda, also, you get really one knob there. That's your power level. So at the lowest setting, it's, what is it, uh, 128 megs of, of memory and a low amount of CPU, all the way up to 1.5 gigabytes with a high amount of CPU. So based on your backlog, maybe you back up messages, you can turn that up, process them real fast, or you don't have any messages, you can turn that way back down, scale accordingly, and again, you just have one knob that you need to worry about. And this allows you to filter all your messages, process everything, it's, it's really, really great. So now let's talk through an architecture here. This is an architecture I've seen uh, repeated over and over. There's little pieces that change depend on what, what the, the, the customer use case is, but it stays, stays pretty consistent. The first, you have your device, and again, we talked about the device having the certificates loaded on it. Make sure you protect your certificate. Uh, then you need whatever your SDK is. In this case here, for example, maybe Node.js or Python or whatever you want as your, your SDK there. You then can communicate that across uh, MQTT to the topic. So this is the device gateway that we talked about earlier. From the topic, you can then route it through a rule to like Kinesis, for example, here. So now we streamed it into Kinesis, and so it's now sitting there. From Kinesis, flows through Lambda. So doing some date filtering, maybe uh, augmenting some data, removing some stuff that's not necessary, whatever. And then storing in DynamoDB. Once it's in Dynamo, World's your oyster, right? So I kind of mentioned this earlier, maybe when certain messages come in, you want to uh, send an alert that says uh, um, these messages came in, or maybe if messages don't come in for 24 hours, you want to generate an email or a note that says, hey, uh, this pill dispenser didn't dispense pills for 24 hours, what's going on? So you can go and do that with SNS. And then maybe you want to make it interactive from voice. So uh, if, if you have a hands-free environment or something like that, you can easily write a Lambda skill that's We'll go and interact with that DynamoDB and then report back out whatever uh, needs to be reported back out to Alexa. Like, uh, Alexa did uh, device 31 dispense medication today. Alexa comes back and says, yeah, it dispensed it at 3 o'clock. Or says, no, it didn't dispense it for 10 days. So you can really, once you have it in Dynamo, you can go in wherever you need to go. So the real key thing is just getting it into uh, the data store in AWS. Now, we're a healthcare audience here, right? So this is the healthcare track. So there's a bit of an elephant in the room here as we've been talking about all these services. And that's, that elephant here is that only one of the six services that I mentioned are HIPAA eligible. And now as a quick aside here, I found out at 1 a.m. this morning that we actually added two new HIPAA eligible services. Um, Postgres uh, RDS, or Postgres SQL RDS is now uh, HIPAA eligible, or BAA eligible, as well as Aurora RDS. So those are recently added, but that's a bit of an aside. Doesn't help our problem here, right? We still only have uh, one that's eligible. So let's go back to that architecture here and kind of a slimmed down version of it so we still flow it through. So what we're seeing in this scenario is what customers are doing is they're looking at their data and they're saying, okay, we have PHI data and non-PHI data. And this applies with telemetry and these devices as well. So you have things like uh, ambient light, uh, you have things like sound, moisture, all these things that may not be PHI data. All that data can flow right through that top framework or that, that top architecture, no problem, it's not PHI, no issue. But for their PHI data, once they understand what is their PHI and they've limited that scope down to that, that, that piece of data, what we're seeing is they'll go and if it's telemetry data, they might bundle it up into small packets and then send it across to S3. If it's like button clicks or periodic data, they'll send those across as they occur into S3. 
S3, as soon as that file lands, will generate a CloudWatch event that says a new file landed. Now, it's not sending PHI. So for a, a bit of a rubric for these lines, the blue lines are PHI data. So it sends something that says, hey, this new file landed. Um, here's a new event for that. The, there's an EC2 instance, which is listening to that SQS. It says, oh, hey, uh, there's a new message that came in that said a new file has landed. Well, I'm going to go pull that PHI data. So again, your PHI just goes from S3 over to EC2. That EC2 then applies whatever encryption is, or is necessary to load it into DynamoDB to meet the BAA requirements. And poof, it's now in DynamoDB. That data is there, and it's, uh, it's good. Now, maybe if they need to get it out, if they want to do their own emailing, if they want to do their own messaging, whatever, um, they can still route it through an EC2 instance and send it to the clients however they want to send it. But you can see here two parallel tracks, and this allows them to both decouple what is PHI, non-PHI, and have two different flows that both use the same sort of concepts to get that data um, through to their end clients. So that's that story. So that's the first story. So the second story is about wanting to just get the data. What if I don't want to build a device? I just want this data so that uh, I can go in and, and I, I want to know what the, the wellness of my population is, or I, I just want to get this information out of all these myriad of devices that are out there in the world, and I just don't have the time, effort, or energy to go through and integrate with all those frameworks and platforms. So we have, a, we have partners out in this space who can really help with this, and Validic is one of them. So Validic has a, a platform here who they go through and they handle all of that integration for you. So they go through and they tie in with all of these uh, fitness devices or clinical devices that are out there. They go through, they pull all that data in, and they allow that, that data to be exposed to you so you can go and integrate with it. So here's a quick example of their architecture. So they have something on the outside that goes and integrates with all of these third-party devices. So they spend a whole lot of effort integrating with all these frameworks and platforms for you. They take all that data, they pull it into their system, and then something that, that may be obvious, but maybe not, all these systems, even if you have two different <coughs> pedometers, they don't store their data in the same way. So Validic makes a huge effort to standardize and normalize that data, put it all within a, a standard schema, load it off into their database, and then make it accessible so you can then use it within your healthcare system. So you can then pull that data in, integrate with it. You don't need to integrate with all those devices. You get the data. You can now make the insights and whatever actions that you need to make. Um, also, it's kind of interesting here. So, Validic is uh, taking advantage of de-identification and anonymization of, of data quite heavily. And once you've de-identified data or anonymized data, again, depending on your security office's posture, you may consider that no longer PHI. And if, it, if your office does no longer consider that PHI, then the, you can use whatever services you want. So in this case here, they have anonymized, or I'm sorry, de-identified um, images. And so they can go in and use Lambda to go in and do uh, image uh, algorithm calibration on these images and uh, output their results. So they're able to now start using all of these services because they've gone through and de-identified that data. So with that, I want to talk about the third story here. The third story, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, about how to help your family at, at night or something like that using Alexa skills uh, to help understand if there's a fever or something uh, like that that may be affecting your children. And so uh, I would like Nitin to come up here and talk through uh, what him and uh, Boston Children's did, and um, yeah, take it away. Cool. Thank you, Chris. Um, and I think that those were really uh, insightful to, to know the capabilities of uh, uh, the IoT platform from uh, AWS. Really, a lot of options, a lot of ways to the, that you can integrate IoTs. Um, so I'd like to share um, how IoTs like Alexa-enabled devices, mostly focusing on voice, um, can deliver real value uh, for, for healthcare services. Um, and kind of a little bit kind of focusing on the development, um, it's, it's um, like how, uh, kind of go through the journey uh, that we went through with, the, with this healthcare skill that, that we, um, we, we built on and, and dive a little bit deeper into uh, kind of uh, the development process. So just a quick introduction about Boston Children's. It's um, the, the premier uh, pediatric institution in, in the country affiliated with Harvard Medical School. Um, kind of highlighting its focus on clinical research and innovation. It is uh, uh, the largest recipient of NIH funding, uh, pediatric focus uh, NIH funding. Um, innovation is one of the pillars of our organization. Um, and at Boston Children's, the Innovation and Digital Health Accelerator, uh, we're looking to extend its know-how and reach. 
Um, and, and the way we're doing that is to bring in the clinical expertise within the healthcare institution, partnering with um, industry uh, startups uh, to launch healthcare in, uh, the products that, uh, that enables health, healthcare access and, and improve out outcomes. Um, so certainly, if anybody interested, please check, out, check us out there. Um, we view uh, the patient's care uh, through this process. The patient's experience uh, it goes through the, different, uh, the whole journey that a patient takes through, throughout their care process. Their, um, the care starts uh, well before a patient um, comes to the healthcare institution. Uh, and, and, it's, uh, and an example like, of, uh, like parents we know are, are looking to the internet for for education, for guidance uh, about uh, their kids' medical conditions or symptoms that they, that they have. Uh, an example um, of, of a quote from um, a parent with two kids um, that they did look for uh, confirmation. But as we know, there are a lot of sources out there um, that are not trustworthy and a lot of ambiguous information that's out there. So at Boston Children's, what we've been doing um, uh, over the last few years is to embed clinical decision support in consumer devices. And that ranges from um, symptom checking, fever uh, guidance um, with, with thermometers, or embedding uh, imaging in, uh, information into uh, uh, imaging devices from G and Philips, um, and, and, or, or is it bringing the uh, genomics information in, into the medical record? So given that, kind of focusing on um, the kids with, with our mission to, uh, to deliver best-in-class care, so we've been working on a, ki a, a platform called KidsMD, uh, which aims to, to provide uh, uh, healthcare information which is trustworthy to the parents that can be accessed anytime and anywhere and through various mediums. In order to get started, like what better platform to bring it to, uh, to reality than to, uh, to get started with, with Alexa? So here, I'll kind of give a quick demo of, um, let's see how it goes, of the scale. Alexa, ask KidsMD about fever. Welcome to KidsMD powered by Boston Children's. Please tell me your child's age. You can say things like five years or 10 months. Uh, seven years. Please tell me your child's temperature, including the decimal, in degrees Fahrenheit. 102.4. Oh, seven years and 102.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Is that correct? Yes. Your child's temperature indicates a mild to moderate fever. Will you like to check on dosing instructions for acetaminophen, known as Tylenol, or ibuprofen, known as Moetrin, or Advil? Stop. Thanks for using the skill from Boston Children's Hospital. So again, I just can't stop. Like, it goes into medication dosing. There are like different symptoms that, that uh, for, from cold to cough that uh, parents could kind of um, ask. And that was just kind of the first kind of uh, wave that, that we want to kind of get it out there, have consumers play with, with it. But certainly kind of highlights one of the use cases of kind of, of deploying an IoT and kind of and using voice in, in an interactive manner. But let me go through like, uh, some of the more technical details, for some of the, uh, it's a technical conference, so we'll be interested in. Um, so the so kids uh, MD skill follows a very traditional uh, Alexa skills architecture. Here are uh, the questions uh, that a user asks um, to an Alexa enabled device um, are, uh, are codified by ABS, uh, they're made available to, to your skill, which in our case kind of goes through a conversational process um, with, with the user, uh, uh, as, as we saw, kind of collecting additional information, uh, passes that information back to our decision support uh, platform, which comes back with the recommendations that then get um, streamed back to the, the consumer um, uh, using spoken words and spoken language. Um, in addition, kind of um, using a companion app uh, to deliver additional details uh, about, uh, about that uh, the, the symptom that the, the consumer is looking to get information on. And in future, we're looking to integrate with the patient's medical record um, as uh, Alexa gets more uh, HIPAA compliant to deliver more personalized um, healthcare information to the patients. So a lot of possibilities. 
Now, one can uh, de uh, develop a Lexus skill um, and can have your, uh, your own web service uh, that, that complies to the AVS request and response specifications. Um, so certainly kind of um, Alexa uh, uh, enables that. Uh, the, the approach that we took, and, and certainly it's one of the most popular ones, is to use Lambda um, to, to develop the skill, um, have the kind of the code interactions uh, happen uh, on Lambda. Uh, but then further along, kind of using uh, the platform. And, and for KidsMT, which, which runs on AWS, some of the components that, that we uh, utilize are the API gateway kind of for proxying and layering on authentication for the clients, uh, EC2 for the core decision support, uh, the, uh, the decision engine, um, Amazon RDS, MySQL specifically for um, rules and, and anonymous um, auditing to, to, to help on, on clinical research, and S3 for some of the content um, storage. Uh, getting into a little bit more kind of development uh, focus and uh, kind of some of the, uh, the approaches that we took. Um, one can kind of use different uh, technology stacks. You can use Python, you can use Java, and certainly can Node.js is, is one of the uh, more popular ones, and, and that's uh, something that, that we also kind of uh, leveraged. Uh, so did, the skill is kind of developed on Node.js, runs on Lambda. Um, as we started on this exercise, like last year, we, we, we had our own homegrown JavaScript uh, application architecture, um, and that's what we kind of initially went with. But we have kind of gradually kind of migrated over to uh, this new node module uh, that came out earlier this year called the Lexus Skills Kit. And it brings in a lot of uh, the best practices and, and, and framework components that, that are convenient and, and easy to kind of use, and you, you likely need that for, for any, any serious uh, skill development. So I'll just kind of highlight quickly kind of some of the secure capabilities and how we leveraged it. So one of the, one of the things it does provide is the ability to um, to structure your architecture uh, using events and handlers. Um, so certainly events could be predefined uh, intents that the Alexa Skills Framework provides, um, or these could be your own custom intents. Um, and, 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 and certainly you can kind of wire up appropriately the handlers um, appropriate to those events. You could generate your own um, custom events too. Um, and here, um, here is an example of a custom event handler. Um, here is an example of a uh, custom intent that's generated from a predefined intent, which is like okay, when the, the skill is canceled, what do you need to do? It sends this custom event, which uh, uh, responds with an exit response and, and saves the context of the, of the user. Additionally, uh, the, the framework uh, allows us to kind of uh, structure your code based on different states um, and have different uh, and intents that perform differently in terms of different states. And I'll talk a little bit more about the importance of, of considering states for a conversational skill. Um, additionally, it provides convenient options to, to store the context uh, of the skill, the, the user preferences, um, into DynamoDB for, uh, for longer storage. An uh, example of um, how you, you, know, you manage kind of context, um, uh, kind of things that you need to track uh, through, through the skill, um, pr convenient ways to respond back um, to, uh, to the consumer, whether with, the, with a question or whether with a question and uh, a card. So uh, a quick uh, note on kind of project structure. Um, as you kind of develop your skills, certainly kind of make sure that you're, you're um, organizing your, your, uh, the Alexa skills assets from uh, schema uh, structure to custom slots uh, and utterances, and internally kind of have, paying attention to the structure based on um, your application architecture for the skill, uh, both in terms of handlers, the models that you need to set up, um, the, the tests uh, included within it. A few notes on uh, debugging. Uh, we, we use uh, Node.js, so certainly uh, uh, any ID that supports Node.js development, you can uh, locally debug your, your Lambda code, can have it de can it deployed on, on Lambda and, um, and, and have it can run through and, and debug it. Um, we use Visual Studio Code, and, and there's a really nice blog uh, from Nathan Grice uh, about it, and specifically around uh, the permissions that you need to set up for the execution role for, for Lambda. Um, uh, again, just like any kind of software project, paying attention to a comprehensive test scripts, um, and, and voice is, is another medium, so, so just making sure that your testing is solid, kind of use a good test, you know, testing framework. Um, here I just call out one that we use, uh, Jasmine, has good support for Node.js, is a behavioral driven uh, framework, uh, and again, a reference to this how you want to kind of get started. 
Um, in terms of integration testing, um, so there, there are some tools. Again, I think the, the space is evolving in that. Uh, from the Alexa Skills, uh, from the Alexa Developers Console, you could use Server Simulator, certainly very helpful um, as, um, as you're kind of looking through and see what is the context with the request and response structures um, that, that are flowing between uh, Lambda and between AVS. Um, and certainly kind of you could use, use a device or use Ecosim for kind of live testing. In terms of deployment, we, we leverage, uh, again, it's an, uh, a known module um, uh, which, which is built on AWS SDK, makes it super easy to package for Lambda and deploy to Lambda. You don't have to kind of archive, up, upload uh, um, your artifacts. Um, it does support kind of integrated uh, unit testing as well. Um, in, in terms of kind of our, from our experience, there are a few things I'll just kind of li like to kind of call, call out. Um, and one, one is um, around states. So as, um, as a developer, as a, as a designer, as you're modeling behavior of, of user interactions, um, you need to consider states. And so states can be the different modes your skill could be in, um, or it could be different pathways that, that the skill could take. It could be the different behavioral uh, uh, state of as, as the user flows through, as, the, as your skill kind of goes through the different, uh, the, the user flow. So how do you want to manage that? Like, so again, like um, you notice like uh, I stopped uh, at the symptom checker state, but it was getting into the dosing. So there's, there's ways for us to directly get into dosing. So being able to model uh, some of these different interactions with states and having appropriate handlers that, um, that you can codify uh, to, to, for this would be, um, is, is good to think early in, in your design. Another pattern I want to call upon is the, is decision trees. Um, any conversational skill, um, or most of them, like requires input from, from the users, and the, you're, you're tracking and changing the behavior of, of your, of your uh, interaction with the user based on their previous responses. So thinking through that implementation rather than um, you know, a, a whole few, uh, big implementation is to can think through in using decision trees. You can, you can set up your own custom nodes, set up the rules around that, how the workflow happens. Um, in this particular case, um, um, you, could, you could test it out later as the, like, as you request like dosing uh, guidelines, these are based on a, a person's age and weight. And so kind of how it can go through those checks and balances to be able to get to those guidelines um, is, is key. Um, another thing is kind of managing context in the scale. Uh, so by default, kind of the session object that's kind of provided by, uh, the, by Lambda for the Alexa skills kit. It's time-based. It's time-based for the identification. You could, you could certainly use it to uh, store context that, that's temporary in nature. Um, you, you can access like user and, and application in, uh, informational objects. Um, but more importantly, I think if you're looking for a persistent state, use DynamoDB. Uh, the, frame, uh, the, the module uh, I shared earlier provides convenient ways for, for you to kind of store that, um, and it's super helpful. Uh, another thing again, around just slot types, leverage built-in slot types. They are, they are great um, in, uh, in recognizing uh, these predefined uh, data sets. Uh, custom slot types are, are huge, and, um, and they, they really improve. Uh, they're very really good at kind of uh, recognizing the, the terms. Uh, we, we had really great success in, in recognizing various different medical terms, from medications to... Um, uh, to different tests, um, and uh, Alex was very, uh, was, uh, had a very low error, error rate in, in terms of uh, not uh, recognizing any of these things. Um, plus, like custom slots do provide support for uh, your, your free form kind of respon uh, responses from the user if you want to con consume those, uh, though there is a time limitation on that. For more, uh, for more natural like speech output to the user, um, the Alexa Skills Kit also supports uh, speech synthesis markup uh, language, um, which has which provides abilities for uh, introducing pauses between words, um, using predefined words uh, to naturally sound out dates or digits. Um, so that's that's super helpful. Um, here's an example like how we kind of we use it within our skill. Um, Phenom is another feature where uh, phonetic uh, pronunciation, if, if that's key, and that's, that's uh, really important for some of the medical terminology, and we, we had kind of play around, that, uh, play around with that a little bit. Um, an example 
like how the Motrin is pronounced, uh, Alexa was not by default uh, up to it. Uh, so we had to kind of uh, tune it uh, with, with phonetic uh, uh, information. And um, the Alexa, the, the developer's console kind of provides you the way to test some of this out. So certainly kind of leverage that, um, is, uh, super helpful. Um, with your, like if you're deploying to Lambda, certainly kind of uh, AWS Lambda CloudWatch, um, you get a lot of like logging abilities, the, the metrics, um, some of the monitoring capabilities can comes for free. So, so th those are great. Um, if, if you're certainly, if you're looking to, to capture and, and understand from the errors and exceptions that your skill or the code may be generating, certainly kind of pay attention to, to that early. Um, capture your errors, um, identify those, and uh, so continue to make improvements. Um, and on the same lines, in terms of user interactions, like what are your users um, asking the skill for? So uh, I know um, Amazon provides some of that ability for, uh, uh, and they, they do share that with app developers. Uh, but also have some of that um, uh, considerations in your design if you, if you want to continue to improve upon the skill um, uh, as, as you uh, proceed with it. Um, and again, as, as, um, as we, we noticed, like there, the architecture is fairly distributed. Like any, any service and components could go down and could jeopardize uh, uh, the, the, uh, the experience for the user. So having appropriate monitoring of the different uh, components in, in this distributed architecture is important. Uh, a few uh, other uh, features I want to um, just call upon uh, about uh, that Alexa uh, uh, skills kit and the, uh, the AVS kind of makes available. One is uh, account linking. So what it does, it, it allows a user of, of Alexa uh, device to connect to, uh, uh, to your own system and you can kind of map it to the user of your system. Uh, there are several examples, like um, sure, like uh, the Capital One kind of linking to your own account, Uber linking to your own account. We've been lo looking at kind of integrating that to a patient's own uh, portal account. So this is a like, really great way of, of uh, providing contextual uh, information, and in our case, the healthcare um, information back to the user, storing the preferences. Um, and um, could be, it could, it's, it's done at the time of the installation and leverages and auth, uh, auth authorization flow. Uh, so it's very well documented um, on the developer forums. Um, so, so certainly please take a look. Um, other multimedia uh, features that Alexa Skills could provide, um, the ability to display images um, with, uh, with JPEG and PNG being one of those. Uh, you could use SSML audio tags as part of the, uh, your response back to, to AVS. There's a 90 second limit. And, and the recently introduced audio streaming that, that you could use existing, uh, the, the play intents to, to, to play out some of the, the content if, if, um, if your skill does get into that. What we noticed is that um, as we went through this journey is that voice is another medium of, of delivering some of this information. And you know, we, we've gone, we've uh, learned how we deploy or develop applications for mobile, for web, uh, some of the user experience there. Uh, there, there are a lot of like uh, practices and best practices that, that have been uh, out there. Voice is a new medium. The interactions, the, the, the uh, the expectations that a user has, the expectations that as a developer that we may have from the platform, maybe uh, we may have to kind of fine tune that. So again, like paying attention to that user experience early on with, with that user, uh, with that, uh, with your design is, is key. And, and uh, it took us some time to learn and th through this, like, to, like how we can fine tune it and make it better as an experience. And we started learning uh, through this. Um, so a few things I, I just want to kind of mention that is like, so kind of maintaining an intuitive conversation, use appropriate guidance um, for, for your prompts um, so that the user, you can expect what the user expects what to respond back with or they're, they're not like searching for uh, uh, responses that, that you're not able to handle that within your skill. So they're taking so work around some of these limitations. Balance the amount of verbal responses. And, and the way we, we did that was uh, with companion apps, right? So there's an Alexa companion app. You could have your own mobile apps that get that could serve that additional content. So, uh, voice is not a way, uh, medium through which you can generate paragraphs and paragraphs of information back. There's there's not a retention that a user has. Um, what we have done is also can explore several uh, capabilities, use cases um, within our uh, the healthcare institution in uh, different settings there. And I want to kind of talk about some of those enterprise uh, challenges. 
And, as, and specifically, I think the, these could apply to other IoTs as well as you're looking to deploy this within the enterprise. One is connectivity, like, making sh like as, you, as you're looking to scale it and, and deploy these, what are your enterprise connectivity uh, the limitations or policies under which you need to kind of work with? And these are consumer devices, and, and, and most of us who can work for enterprises know, like, you know the challenges um, that, that, are, that are there for, for us to kind of deploy some of these things. Um, another is security. Um, uh, many of these IOTs are deployed in shared environments, so, uh, um, and specifically like with voice, uh, being able to authenticate the user, being able to uh, authorize and with the level of permissions that they have to do those, those interactions. So how do, you, how do you want to kind of bring that into it? So, having, so, think, uh, so some of those considerations are, are key. Um, and lastly, and again, kind of, as kind of Chris pointed out uh, around HIPAA and with the current state of HIPAA compliance of Alexa, there, there, there the ways that you, you can balance that, like um, what you want to deliver in, uh, uh, through voice and what you want to deliver through other mediums, whether it's your um, existing websites or mobile apps. So balancing the, the uh, using the balance of two to, to work around this, the, this challenge around HIPAA for now. Now voice in, in healthcare is opening up uh, new ways uh, for, for patients and both clinicians to, to, uh, to interact. And for, uh, for patients, it's making it easier. It's going to make it easier for, for them to consume uh, healthcare services, um, have ready access to uh, uh, information um, uh, anywhere and anytime. And for clinicians, it's allowing them to access vast information at their fingertips and in the context of a patient. So they're, they're, it's, it's introducing uh, a lot of efficient workflows um, within, within their, um, their work experience. And, and we're starting to explore these um, at Boston Children's. Um, we, we are very much uh, bullish on kind of the use of voice in healthcare. Um, and there, there are several like potential um, op options that we're exploring as kind of home health hubs um, in, the, in the, the patient's uh, bedroom at their home, um, at the bedside of for patient care, and as virtual assistants for clinicians. So just as a, as a quick example of a kind of clinician virtual assistant, um, this is something we're piloting at, at the hospital. So this is an example of, uh, of a clinician looking for uh, a, a dosing guideline, a guideline around an anesthesia drug. Um, just simple, okay? Alexa, ask Children's Hospital anesthesia about dosing for propofol. Dosing for propofol is as follows, IV two to four milligrams per kilogram. To continue, you can say repeat or speak another medication name. Stop. Goodbye. Another quick example. Uh, this is uh, uh, a nurse, like uh, they're, they're drawing a lab test and they need to know like what type of like lab tube that they need to use for this particular lab and what they need to do. It's a quick example. Alexa, ask Children's Hospital Lab about complete blood count. The complete blood count test requires a lavender top tube and a minimum blood volume of one milliliter. Following collection, invert the tube eight times. To continue, you can say repeat or speak another lab order name. Stop. Goodbye. Yeah, again, just like a few examples also of like potential like informational. It could be insightful and, and that, that what uh, either in the moment when you need to be hands-free, uh, what, what uh, clinicians could, could be looking to, to leverage uh, IOTs like uh, certainly Alexa-enabled devices for. Um, so just to conclude, like IOTs are opening up new ways of, of growth uh, of this internet of healthcare. And what it, what it means is that both patients and providers, they are, they, they're, they are getting coupled through uh, the, the entire patient journey. And, and that makes it uh, uh, convenient for uh, for them to kind of stay connected and, and, um, and have better outcomes. And it is delivering IOTs and voice uh, specifically, is delivering the promise of connected healthcare. And what that means is that healthcare services and delivery of care is portable, it's accessible anywhere, anytime. It is proactive, it's, it's empowering patients, it's um, ensuring that uh, patients are able to kind of take ownership of their health and they are plugged in. And specifically, it, it is patient-centric, and bringing in everybody who's involved in the patient's care, kind of bringing them all together. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Chris has a quick announcement. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And be sure to fill out your surveys. 
And then one other announcement. So from a different presentation, uh, Cambia Healthcare and um, 8K Miles is going to be hosting a happy hour at the um, Japanus. Japanus. Uh, so just right down the hallway in Mirage. So if anyone wants to go to that happy hour, they're hosting that. So thank you, everyone, for your time. And thank you for being here today. Appreciate it.